I didn't have a plan B, so I just had to make this work. So, you know, I always talk about the Titanic, it takes forever to turn. You want to be nimble in this business. You want to be able to shift and change really in a really short space of time to be able to grasp the opportunity that's in front of you. And it's a great opportunity, this industry. It's provided so much to me. In 2021, you had some challenges in your own career. I had a sea of hate come towards me at that time, like I'd never seen and I'm sure I never will again. It really, really affected me. It affects me now, it, just as I'm talking about it. it. Welcome to the Upshot podcast by Homely, where we invite you into honest conversations with entrepreneurs, challenges, and long-standing legends shaping the real estate industry today. Welcome to the third edition of the Upshot podcast by Homely. Uh, we're very excited to have Matt Scafidi on the program here today. He's a wonderful agent, been in the industry for a very long period of time, and we're keen to get his thoughts on the market, uh, where we, we th see things going uh, over the next few months, and also have a chat to him about some of the challenges that he's faced throughout his career and how he's got on top of that uh, and on the other side of it. So, Matt, great to have you on the program. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate you having me. Thank you. Now, we had a chat the other day and uh, I said to Marika, who does obviously this podcast in the back end, if we could just do exactly what we spoke about the other day, that would be fantastic because that was absolutely ripping. But uh, give us a bit of a rundown. You've obviously been in the industry for a number of years. You've worked at Woodard's, Noel Jones, Jealous Craig. You've got some really good insight uh, into the property market from a sell side, but now you're working on the buy side as well with your advocacy business. How are you finding the property market at the moment? Yeah, the market uh, is challenging for a number of reasons at the moment. We've got historic low um, supply, um, so listings are just very, very hard to get at the moment for agents. And uh, to be honest, uh, I feel better being on the other side than having to compete um, with uh, with everybody on that side at the moment because I was talking to someone the other day and we mentioned this when we spoke that you know, he was competing against 12 other agents for one listing and you just shake your head and just think that that's a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of effort from a lot of people uh, and only one person can be successful there. So, you know, they're talking about fees of 0.8% and, and everything else and it's just not sustainable. Um, but what we are seeing is that uh, due to this low stock levels, um, from the buying side, we're seeing that a lot of clients are now seeing value in the um, in the proposition that we offer them, the services we offer, and uh, we've really been inundated, I suppose, with uh, inquiry over the past little while because they're just getting frustrated as buyers. Um, as I said, there's low stock. Um, when they're going to auction, uh, they're they're going over by you know a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, and that's not because it's been a great result as such. A lot of the time, it's you know perhaps a little bit cheeky on on the quoting and all that sort of thing. Uh, and our job is to navigate uh, for our clients through that uh, and make sure they don't waste uh, unnecessary energy on properties that they're just never going to be able to afford. So um, it's uh, it's an interesting time, but with international borders and everything opening do feel that there's going to be a little bit of a normalization in the next sort of three to six months and uh, stock levels will come up, buying, buy, buyers sort of levels will, will even up and then all of a sudden that, that pricing will just normalize that little bit and flatten out. I don't think it's going to drop off the edge of a cliff, uh, but uh, it's going to be easier for buyers and they're going to have more choice. So do you think the stock levels are going to pick up? I know that on homely standpoint, we're down about 15 odd percent in terms of volume to the site over the last 12 months, which is very interesting because I'm speaking to a lot of agents out there in the marketplace and it's a pretty consistent theme across the board, bad market, no one wants to sell. Do you think it's going to pick up at all? Well, all I can say, Ben, is it should because I'm telling the vendor advocacy clients that we're talking to at the moment, they want to be on the market sooner rather than later. Uh, because they want to make the absolute most of these low stock levels because the low stock level is driving price. Um, so what, unfortunately, the real estate market uh, has done on a constant cycle over the time I've been in real estate is it's very sheep-like and, and, and herd mentality. And I can just, the conversations that I'm having with potential sellers, the conversations I'm having with agents is that everybody's just sitting there waiting for Easter waiting for Anzac Day, waiting for the school holidays to finish. And I think what we're going to see in sort of that May, June, July quarter 
um, is we're going to see a lot of stock come onto the market that have been holding back. And I think there's going to be a lot of vendors at that time that are going to be saying, well, where's all the buyers gone and uh, and where's the good pricing gone? And they will have missed the boat. And yeah. this real estate market, as you know, whether you're buying or whether you're selling, you can miss the boat by waiting too long. Mm. And what about off markets? I know that, you know, sometimes owners want to take the properties to auction because they want to, you know, sky's the limit with the auction process. Are you finding that a lot of uh, vendors uh, that you're dealing with on the buy side, are, are they open to selling beforehand? Are they more motivated now to sell beforehand or are they wanting to run through? Yeah, listen, I think there's um, uh, sort of vendors are thinking at the moment that they get a bit nervous. Um, if everything isn't absolutely flying along with numbers through open for inspections, re repeat inspections, Section 32 requests and everything else, they are getting that little bit nervy and there are, there is quite a lot of properties transacting prior to auction. In fact, uh, here at Abode, um, we have only bought property at auction this year so far with clients that have engaged just, just on our bidding service only. Our full buying clients, we haven't bought at auction as yet. We've bought either before, we've bought um, afterwards, or you know, we've we've made the process come come a lot forward. Seen it the first week and uh, and put an offer in, and that's been good enough to get it done uh, with client with, with vendors that are just that little bit nervy at the moment. Very interesting. Very interesting. Now, um, obviously, that's the property market. I, I guess we want to just understand a little about your career to date as well, because I know that that's been fairly extensive and, you know, you've transitioned from the sell side of things to both, I guess, the vendor advocacy, but also the buyer advocacy side of things. Are you able to give us a brief rundown on your career to date? Yeah, sure. Um, I got into it late. I was 36 years of age. I'd been in a packaging selling um, uh role for quite a number of years, for about 13 years, always harboured a want to be in real estate. Um, at the time, um, my wife was having our second baby, we were building a house and uh, so she wasn't working. Um, so we thought it'd be a great time to go to commission only uh, and uh, and give it a crack. So she said I had 12 months and uh, if I didn't get it done in 12 months, well, I'd need to be back um, selling boxes again. So, you know, for me, though, there was no plan B. Basically, uh, the old uh, story about the, the guy burning the boats, so there was no boats to return to. That's pretty much what I did. And uh, I was lucky enough to start at Woodard's Real Estate in Blackburn. Um, I was there for just over three years. Uh, learned a hell of a lot in that time and, uh, and got my career up and running and, uh, and sort of started focusing on the Mitcham area. I, I went into that office and I said, right, the city of Whitehorse, what suburb was the least sales that we made last year? And it was Mitcham, and I was moving to Mitcham, so I thought, well, that's a, a sign. Um, I'm not going to upset too many people in the office if I focus on that. So I did that, and uh, that led me from there to um, to transitioning over to Noel Jones, who offered uh, me a partnership in, in opening a business, which we did in July 2013, so Noel Jones Mitchum began. Uh, it was uh, it was a startup business. Uh, was doing really good numbers, really ve very quickly. Uh, we were working very very hard, but uh, we we're having a lot of fun doing that as well. And then later on, um, after about eight years, we merged with Jealous Craig in Blackburn to create Jealous Craig Whitehorse, and was there for about three years uh, as well until I transitioned over into advocacy so that's a very short version i don't want to bore people to tears um but uh that's that's where i've been up until now fantastic um and obviously you would have seen the industry change a lot over that time uh you know when you started you would have been making thousands of phone calls i would imagine do you th see things have changed in terms of the prospecting side of things for agents these days is it more social media based or is it really just simply a volume uh, business Oh, listen, I don't think many things have changed in a long time, Ben, to be completely frank. Uh, I think that it's always about going back to basics. And, uh, you know, the more people you talk to, the more people that know you, the more chance you've got of actually having, excuse me, a really good business. And um, 
social media is going to help you, um, all those sort of things. I focus on the community a lot, um, doing sponsorship and, um, and and as much charity work and everything as possible. Uh, I felt that that was the a good way to immerse myself in the community, have myself known. Uh, and then when they were ready, uh, they could reach out at that time. But still, at the end of the day, lots of calls to be made in real estate. There always will be. Uh, I can't ever see it changing too much. I think that that human connection after COVID and everything else that we've had, um, people, people crave it. And, you know, it, it's all very well. There's a lot of really good stuff happening in the AI um, side of things and everything else. But at the end of the day, it requires somebody to pick up a phone, uh, talk to somebody, book a meeting and uh, and get face to face. Yeah, very good point. I know that, uh, you know, there's a lot of technology out there that claims to change the world and, you know, assist uh, property managers and sales agents doing all their tasks and those sorts of things. But you've absolutely nailed it. Ultimately, this is a service-based industry. People want to hear from you. They want to have that connection. So without that, you're not going to go very far, I wouldn't have thought. In terms of your career, uh, did you have good success initially or did it take you a bit of time to get traction in your marketplace? Oh, listen, man, I didn't have enough time to, to uh, allow myself too much time to get things going. And uh, I had to hit the ground running. Uh, as I said, I had a second child in the way, wife not working, building a home. Uh, there was lots of bills to pay. So uh, it wasn't all about the money for me, but it was certainly a motivator. And, um, and for mine, I just had to get in earlier, stay later. Uh, I had a really, really supportive wife in Tanya, and uh, she was amazing through those first probably two to three years. Uh, we sat in front of TV, stuffing envelopes, and you know when we're watching TV and all that sort of thing. Um, she was really, really supportive of me having early starts, late nights, and uh, and she allowed me to sort of build the business in that time frame. So um, you know, there was no, as I said earlier, there was no going back to packaging for mine. I didn't have a plan B, so I just had to make this work. So um, yeah, we had a we had a pretty good start early and um, and kept that momentum going. Yeah. There's nothing like a mortgage and, uh, you know, I guess a bit of financial pressure to keep you motivated and focused. So, you know, it's uh, credit to you. Uh, in terms of, you know, you're a big advocate for mental health. Um, we've spoken about this a little bit off air. Uh, what sparked this? What was the main driver for you to sort of venture down this path and be an advocate for it? Well, a lot of people sort of ask me that question over the time and um, I think they're expecting an answer that, you know, I had uh, friends or, or whatever that, that had committed suicide and, and all that sort of thing. Um, that wasn't the case. I did know of some people, uh, but not, not directly as such. But I just felt that it was a space that didn't get enough airtime. Um, certainly, you know... It, reporters on TV are told not to report suicide because they're, um, they're afraid that of copycats and, and all that sort of thing, which is just crazy. It shows um, a real lack of knowledge in and around um, mental health. And uh, it was something that uh, I, was, I was invited along to um, with 100 Words in their first event uh, in Hawthorne in Glen Ferry. And uh, went along to that, uh, came away with a couple of mates and we said we need to bring something like this to Mitchum. And, uh, and that's what we did. We, we got on to 100 Words to Craig Turton there and we said, what can we do? And uh, he said, well, you could do an event yourself. Uh, we did that September 2019. We had 160 uh, men uh, gather at uh, Mitchum Social in Mitchum and uh, we had a great night um, in the sense of, of sharing um, and, you know, there, there was some sad moments, of course, um, but it, it started a conversation and I think that that's what sort of drove me towards it was getting that conversation started, having the stigma lifted, um, you know, that, uh, that everybody, not just men, but everybody um, should be able to feel comfortable in being able to say that they're not okay. And, you know, I feel that um, a lot of people still sort of think that people, they use the term play the mental health card. And that's really frustrating because anybody that's been down that path knows that you don't play that card unless it's, it's there. So, yeah. Mm. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's a very interesting topic uh, these days. I know that you know earlier on, uh, it, all men, for example, were asked just to get on with it, or there was just an acceptance that you know they would just keep it to themselves. But certainly of late, I've noticed that a lot more, a lot more people, particularly men, are open to having conversations, and uh, it's very very powerful uh, to get it all out, discuss your feelings, and uh, it's certainly a lot better for it. So kudos to you for getting into that space. Um, now, speaking of mental health, this, I guess, is going to be, you know, I guess the main point of conversation today, because in 2021, you had some challenges in your own career. Um, and what I'd like to do, if it's all right, is I'll get you to run through uh, what happened uh, and the result of this. And I guess the impact that that had on you generally uh, from you know, a personal standpoint, a business standpoint, and some of the things that you put in place to get through that. Yeah, it was a difficult time. Um, it's, it's one of those things that you look back on and, and you, I still think to myself, I don't understand quite how it all happened and, and blew up like that. But I simply asked a question on a Facebook, a private Facebook forum um, you know, whether uh, we were coming out of lockdown and I wanted to know whether a barbell I was considering buying was made in Australia or whether it was made in China. Simple as that. And it wasn't that I had any any issue against China, anything at all. If I had have said America, Switzerland, whatever, I'm sure it would have been fine. I didn't quite realise uh, in real estate um, you sort of – you switch off from, from – the news and all that sort of stuff because you don't want negativity. You've got to always be sort of pushing positivity. But I wanted to support Australian at that time. I wanted to support local business, local business. So I didn't care where you were from, what God you pray to, et cetera. As long as you're a local business, that's what I wanted to do coming out of three months of lockdown. Anyway, that was taken. That was put onto WeChat uh, by whomever. I, I still don't know and I still don't I don't really care, to be honest. Um, that person, I'm sure, sort of has regret for what happened there. I would hope so. Um, and it went viral. It, it was sort of – it was a Sunday night that I made the post and by Monday there was – stirrings and then tuesday it just was like a wildfire it just went crazy and herald sun wanted to know about it etc and uh yeah so it was it was there that uh the company i was with stood me down whilst they worked out what they were going to do um i'd hold no grudges uh there at all uh, at the end of the day they made the decision that they felt was right for uh for them myself uh, you know the brand at that time and uh you know but I had a sea of hate come towards me at that time, like I'd never seen, and I'm sure I never will again. Um, you know, horrible, horrible things that were shared and said and, and threatened, and uh, it really, really affected me. It affects me now, it, just as I'm talking about it. It's um, yeah, it, it does still affect me to this day at, at times, and uh, it was. That first sort of 24, 48 hours was just a nightmare. It really was. It was, I woke up every morning after very little sleep, um, thinking that, it, hopefully, hoping that it would all go away. Uh, and it certainly wasn't. It was still there. So um, I had to shut down social media. I had to, I just spoke to nobody and, and communicated with nobody at that time. Um, but you know what? The, the positive thing, I suppose, out of it was that. After about that first sort of 48 hours, it started to turn the other way. And because the Herald Sun picked up the story and, uh, you know, it went on to Sky News and it went on to Pauline Hanson's Facebook page and it was just, it was just crazy. I couldn't believe it. Um, but, you know, I was, I was suffering anxiety at that time and panic attacks and all that sort of thing. And it was really, really tough um, on my wife, on my kids. Um, on my family and friends, and uh, it was just a, a horrible, horrible time. So, you know, but the support that did come back um, made it bearable, I suppose, at the time. And in an industry where it gets a lot of flack at times, we saw the Four Corners report the other night, night and everything else. In an industry that does get that at times, um, I really saw the good side of the industry at, at that time. I would have received... I think in the order of sort of 2,000 messages over that next sort of 48-hour period after the first 48 of positivity, of um, support, um, of 
you know, people just offering things, whatever they could offer, that they were prepared to offer. So that part of it was um, was refreshing and um, and I appreciate everybody that, that reached out at that time and a lot of people at Homely were the same and reached out at that time as well. Um, so I really, really uh, appreciated that. But it was a time where I had to then make a decision on what I was going to do going forward and uh, there were some moments where I felt that, I was just going to leave the industry completely and and do something else because I didn't want my name, uh, my mobile number, all those sort of things out in the public domain again. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was a crazy time. But uh, I was told by a very smart person that uh, that was with me that whole, whole sort of journey from start to finish, um, not to make any big decisions um, when you're having um, that sort of uh, thing happen in your life. And I didn't. And uh, I uh, got to a point where I thought, right, no decisions to be made just yet. Um, all I knew was that uh, I needed to step away from the business I was in um, and and do something else. And I, but I wasn't quite sure at that time what. It's uh, quite extraordinary that, you know, you make a Facebook post, uh, you know, it, unintentionally it seems like that you know you were just making a comment and within a very short period of time your life was completely flipped upside down and you know a career that you'd worked very very hard on was basically taken away from you in a really short period of time I can't even imagine what you went through and you know it I would hope that people that you know went for the jugular in this situation can at least reflect on that and say you know I, I didn't you know maybe we need to think about what that person was going through because obviously you went through hell you've managed to get to the other side of it which is fantastic and you've, you've started up a new business now with your advocacy side of things uh, that's obviously going very well for you um, in terms of the resilience was there a stage where you just wanted to get out of real estate altogether and, and just give up or what was your thought process following this event Oh, listen, there was – firstly, I'd just like to say that, the, you know, with everything, there's there's two sides to every story. There's probably three, really, when you really think about it. And uh, and the people that were going for the jugular, I think that, um, you know, I think on, on retrospect, they probably feel um, – I would hope feel a little bit different. Nobody reached out to me and asked me my side of the story at that time. They had their version and, and that's what they ran with. But that's okay. Um, I've moved on from all that and uh, the way I see the world now is a lot different if I see something on a current affair or the news or whatever I always take a step back and just think to myself let's just walk a, a mile in this person's shoes and um, it's probably a lot different um, to what is actually being reported so it's changed me a lot but you know in relation I suppose to uh, real estate, I, I was a bit lost there for a while for sure and um, didn't feel that I could do it, um, didn't feel I wanted to do it. And uh, as I said, I just had to I had to get through what I had to get through first um, and then make the, the bigger decisions sort of afterwards, I suppose. And, and that's that's sort of what led me down the path of, uh, of talking to people that, you know, I respected and, and, and loved and, and everything else and... Uh, you know, I mentioned Tanya before and um, um, without her, um, you know, it's I, I, you got to put it out there and just say that I, I might not have been here today. I really might not have. So, um, you know, what it taught me was that uh, you've got to keep your circle really, really small and you've got to make sure that, you know, there's there's – all the highlight reels on social media and everything else that goes on. But at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, what's important is the people that you have around you, your family, your friends. Um, and, you know, you shouldn't be defined by what you do for a living. And that's sort of what I took away from it all. And um, so when I sat down and, and spoke to Tanya, Tanya has always been the sounding board for me. Um, she just said to me, she said, listen, you shouldn't be giving up 15 years of hard work and, and effort and time uh, and experience and it would be um, sad for your clients and everything else if you were to do that. So perhaps just do something that focuses solely on the things that you enjoy, um, fly a little bit more under the radar and, uh, 
and just work with people that know you, like you, trust you. Um, and yeah, and that's what he- headed me down the, the advocacy path and uh, working with buyers and, um, and, and, you know, selling for people that uh, are, it was past clients and everything else. And uh, it's just really given me something that uh, I look forward to every day. Um, I, I get up and uh, I enjoy what I do and we have fun, most importantly. So, Matt, in terms of your career, um, do you view success differently? I mean, is this just a job to you or you know, how do you view your career? Yeah, it's, that's a really good question, Ben, because, um, yeah, it's certainly changed my, my thoughts on that uh, since everything occurred. Um, I want to make sure going forward that uh, I have a life of good balance, um, and, and life balance gets thrown around all the time, work-life balance, etc. But I really do now. Um, you know, we we have an office, but we're not here all the time. We can work from our car, we can work from home, we can we can work here. Uh, we, I want to be really, really flexible on that. Uh, I only want to deal with people that uh, that you know are good people as well, because at the end of the day, you know. At, that's that's where things get to in real estate. You find yourself, um, you're really good clients potentially pay more than your not so good clients that are shopping around sort of 12 agents, as I mentioned earlier, for the cheapest fee. So, um, you know, now we've got a really, really good solid business in the sense of we have our fees on our website. So um, anyone can see what we're charging, all that sort of thing. There's no uh, we run very, very transparently, and we want to make sure that we come from a place of of caring, and uh, but also, and most importantly, to have fun along the way, have fun with our clients, have fun uh, with Dion and myself in the business, also, uh, but also have fun with the agents that we're working with, and we only want to deal with you know those, those good people that uh, that there are so many of in this industry and as i said i think the industry gets a bit of a bad rap at times for the minority of people that uh, that create that so you know as i said my my ethos on success these days is not how much i've written or how much i've taken home or whatever it's how it sounds a bit cheesy but it's how i've helped people the, the most that I possibly could and you know and those those people that leave you Google reviews and you read those and, and you think oh, we've actually made a small change in their life for, for the positive uh, because not everybody has to buy or sell property for good re- uh, for good reasons sometimes it can be bad reasons as well so we just want to be able to help people through that process and I suppose navigate it because there's a lot of mistakes that can be made. There's a lot of traps put in place and we just want to be able to help people through that. Matt, what advice would you give to someone that's having a tough time in the industry? Um, you know, whether they're a new starter, um, just getting into the space, what would you say to them in order to get through some pretty challenging times with this tricky market? And this is from a sales side of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I started just in the middle of the global financial crisis. So, and I remember my mum, I was speaking to her at the time and she said, I can't believe you're leaving a job that's paying you this amount, that's got a company car, that's got security, that's got everything in place for you to go into an industry that you're getting commission only and it's uh, the GFC right now. And my response to her was this, that if I was, if I had enough grit and I had enough resilience to get through that market and survive, then I was going to be able to get through any market. And this is the thing that a lot of the time, um, it's the self-speak that gets you down in this industry. And and that's why I mentioned before that I, I really did switch off a lot from, um, you know, world, world events, politics, all that sort of thing, because it can really get you down. If you watch the Reserve Bank announcement every single month, well, guess what? You're going to come out of that reasonably negative. But what we do know is that it's it's about keeping positive as you can, having, as Chris Helder would say, uh, anyone that doesn't know Chris Helder, you should get to know him. Uh, he's got a book called Useful Beliefs. And you've got to have useful beliefs around how you're going about your business. It's not going to happen straight away. Uh, it's going to be lots of letters that are sent out. It's going to be lots of phone calls that are made. It's going to be lots of people met before there starts to be some traction. 
But what I have seen way too often, Ben, is people leave the industry just at the time. Have you seen that cartoon where the guy's mining through the uh, mine shaft and he's this far from the diamonds and everything on the other side and uh, he gives up and he, and he goes. He's come all this way and he gives up with just this little space to go. That's what a lot of agents will do in this industry. Um, it is a tough industry uh, to do well in, but it's very satisfying once you do. So uh, once you break through, um, you've got pretty much a bulletproof business. It doesn't matter whether it's a GFC, doesn't matter whether it's COVID, um, it doesn't matter. Um, you should still be able to get through. I mean, you look at the market that happened throughout COVID and, you know, people would have been, the people that are talking to themselves negatively, uh, they wouldn't have done too well, but there was so many that did so well because they adjusted really quickly. And, you know, I always talk about the Titanic. It takes forever to turn. You want to be nimble in this business. You want to be able to shift and change um, at yeah, really in a really short space of time to be able to grasp the opportunity that's in front of you. And it's a great opportunity, this industry. It's provided so much to me. And that's why, in the end, when I sort of thought about everything, it was something I didn't feel that I wanted to leave behind completely. So I still wanted to be involved and give back. Um, I think we're just going to finish up with a couple of really quick fire questions for you. Um, the first one is if you were giving advice to buyers, vendors, and agents in the current market, what would be the one bit of advice for each of those parties? <laughs> Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, buyers, I would be saying be ready. Um, get your finance together. Um, be clear on what you can and can't do because at the moment, things that are blowing deals up is conditions that aren't favourable to vendors. So subject to finance, subject to building and pest inspections, um, you know, and settlement terms that don't suit them. If you can be flexible on your settlement, if you can make sure you've got your finance in order, your deposit in order, and that's all ready to go, then we can get a building and pest inspection potentially nice and early and not include that in the actual offer. Um, you're going to have a better opportunity securing the very low stock levels that are out there at the moment. Um, in regards to vendors, my advice to vendors would be get onto the market as quickly as you possibly can right now because if you wait, you will come onto the market with a number of other vendors that are also sitting on their hands. And I've actually written a blog about this on our website. They're sitting on their hands waiting for other things to occur and happen, whereas we are seeing really, really good results coming through at the moment for properties that have been presented well. That's the other tip I'd give vendors. Please don't bring your home to market with all the work required to do to get it up to a particular standard. Take the time, get it prepared, get it done properly so when a buyer walks through, they're not discounting your home based on a few little items that need to be looked after and done. Uh, agents right now, what I would be suggesting is that you need to be building your relationships right now. Um, you need to be talking to your whole database. You need to be getting on the phone and seeing what their take is on the current market and sharing yours at the same time, adding value and giving people an actual relationship as well. Because once things get busy again, You'll get, they're not going to hear from you as much, but now is a great opportunity to really hit those phones, talk to your potential clients, but also talk to your past clients as well and see where they're at, see if you can help their family and friends also. It's a great time when things are a little bit quiet to be hitting the phones. Great advice. Uh, and certainly with the gamut of skills that you've acquired over your career, that is going to be very powerful to a lot of people that are listening. So thank you for that. Final question for you, and this will be a good one for you because obviously you work with a lot of buyers and you're looking to purchase properties out in the marketplace. I've got a million dollars. I give it to you. What are you doing with it in the current market? The current market, what we're probably doing is we are trying to find something for you investment-wise. Um, we're probably steering clear at a million-dollar mark. We're probably steering clear of apartments right now, even though there are some, you know, we have bought a number of apartments for people. But if you're looking for capital appreciation moving forward, if you're looking for great rentability, 
you think about this right now is that if you buy an investment property right now for a million dollars, you're going to get good appreciation because we're going to come out of this market and it's going to continue to go and, and rise. So you're actually buying, I would think, pretty much at the bottom of the, of the curve. And that's the thing. They don't ring the bell at the bottom, uh, but you only know when you're going back up the top that you're at the bottom. So I think that now would be a great time to be buying. I think that if you found something that had um, you know, good accommodation, you're going to get a really, really good rent return because it, right around the country, um, you know, I know Noosa Council, for example, were putting out to their holiday lets. They sent a whole heap of letters out to their holiday lets saying, would you consider full-time letting of your property and taking it away from holiday letting? That's how desperate people are in the country right now to be getting a rental property. So you're not going to be without a tenant. So it's it's rock solid. Whereas you look at the million dollars put into the stock market right now, it's quite volatile and keeps changing and moving all the time. So I would be doing that and making sure, of course, you get a buyer's advocate on board uh, to be able to help you secure that property at the best possible price with the least stress, saving you time and, uh, and hopefully getting you something that's going to pay back in spades in years to come. Great advice. Great advice. Matt, this has been awesome. I've really enjoyed speaking with you today uh, and getting your thoughts on the marketplace and obviously, you know, understanding your career and obviously the challenges that you had a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, great stuff. I've really enjoyed this and thank you very much for being on the program here today. Thanks, Ben. Really, really enjoyed it as well and uh, hopefully Homely keeps uh, doing really well. Also, no worries. Before you go, please hit follow, like and subscribe to make sure you have me and my next guest back in your ears in two weeks time. Until then, make sure you share this episode with your friends and colleagues, find details and resources in the show notes and get in touch via Homely Socials with any questions. That's at homely.com.au on Insta, Facebook and TikTok. 